Good afternoon. I'm Charlotte Burroughs, Chair of the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and I'd like to welcome each and every one of you to today's listening session on AI and algorithmic fairness. So thank you first to our distinguished guests for taking time to share your thoughts with us today. The EEOC is the primary federal agency charged with enforcing the nation's laws against discrimination in employment based on race, color, sex, including pregnancy, gender identity, and sexual orientation, national origin, religion, age, disability, and genetic information. Most relevant to today's discussion are the protections under the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Rehabilitation Act. Last fall, the EEOC launched an initiative building on our prior work to examine the use of artificial intelligence or AI and algorithmic fairness to help ensure that the use of AI and other algorithmic tools in employment decisions will comply with the nation's laws against employment discrimination. As part of the initiative, we're holding a series of listening sessions to hear from stakeholders about the key issues the EEOC should be aware of in this area. And that's why we're here today. I knew it was important to focus on this issue early in my tenure as chair. And I know it's a strong interest of my colleague, Commissioner Keith Sonderling, who is here today as well. And I'm so pleased to work with him on this effort. The reliance on these tools is growing rapidly with more than 80% of all employers and more than 90% of Fortune 500 companies reporting that they now use some form of AI in employment. The use of these new technologies in employment offers potential benefits, but we must make sure that they don't become a high tech pathway to discrimination by causing discrimination on a variety of bases, including race, sex, religion, age, national origin, or disability. However, the challenge of identifying and addressing uh, bias against persons with disabilities in this context has unique uh, issues. And employment uh, you know, for persons with disabilities, when you introduce AI, there are so many varied disabilities and ways that these disabilities can uh, ma manifest that the area of disability on this issue really deserves its own focus. And that's the reason for today's meeting or conversation. Um, for example, video interview technology may inappropriately screen out an individual with a speech impediment because the data used to develop the technology did not uh, account for individuals with speech impediments. And so today we look forward to hearing from our panelists about the unique threats and issues that AI and other algorithmic tools can pose for individuals with disabilities. And we also want to hear about promising practices employers, workers, and vendors could consider adopting. And so with that, I'll turn now to Commissioner Sonderling to share a few opening remarks. Thank you, Chair Burroughs, and thank you for picking such an important topic for our first AI initiative listening session. And thank you to all the participants here for your time and dedication to ensuring disabled workers know their rights and employers know their obligations. We do appreciate your deep knowledge, not only of, the, of these issues generally, but how modern technology, including artificial intelligence, is both helping and hindering applicants and employees with disabilities. I do believe that if carefully designed and properly used, that AI can help workers with disabilities overcome traditional barriers they have faced that have excluded them from thriving in the workplace. For instance, uh, the example you just heard from Chair Burroughs, um, there could be issues with uh, the facial recognition, as you heard, but if employers are just relying on natural language processing to conduct an interview, relying on the substance of their interview, not how they appear, it can eliminate bias at the earliest stages of the hiring process. Although it's highly illegal, there could be times where an employer conducting an interview sees that a person is disabled and thinks to themselves, this person is qualified, but how much is this going to cost me? How much will medical or disability leave cost me or an accommodation cost me? This potential candidate isn't work it. I'm just going to go with somebody without a disability. That's, that's a problem that AI can potentially help because it can't see that 
person is discriminated. But at the same time, if the software cannot understand the interviewee because of a disability, such as a speech impediment, the program will automatically score them lower than someone without a disability, even though they are the most qualified applicant. So as more and more employers begin to use AI in all areas of employment, including to track productivity and evaluate employees' performances, you know, I've talked about the potentially challenging issues for workers with disabilities. There are many cases in which compliance with our laws requires human intervention, especially when it comes to accommodation for pregnant workers, disabled workers, and religious employees. An algorithm set on certain productivity measures may not know that the employee is hindered and hitting their benchmarks because of a need for an accommodation, because these accommodations, as we all know, are generally done through the interactive process by two humans. So an algorithm, no matter how sophisticated, may not be capable of that sort of sensitivity that members of the disabled community need and require. So we're going to talk a lot about the Americans with Disability Act, which we all know is as applicable to AI as it is to any HR decision. But I really want to hear from you. I want to hear what your concerns are and how that if this AI is not properly designed and not properly implemented, how it could really hinder workers with disabilities in the workplace. So thank you for your time today. And thank you to Chair Burroughs for putting this together. Thank you, Commissioner Sonderling. So we have a really esteemed group here, and we're so eager to hear from you. So with that, I will turn first uh, to Erin Rika, Managing Director of Upturn, a nonprofit organization whose mission is to advance equity and justice in the design and governance and use of technology. And with that, uh, you have the floor. Great. Uh, thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen here really quick. All right. Um, so first of all, thank you so much, Chair Burroughs, Commissioner Sonderling, and your staffs for holding this session um, and inviting me to be here today. Uh, my goal for my few minutes is really to set the stage for my fellow panelists. Um, I want to give you examples of the kinds of hiring technologies we're talking about, how they fit together, and how they affect applicants. This first graphic is what we call the hiring funnel. And this is from one of our first research reports on hiring technologies. The, the takeaway point here is that hiring technology isn't just one, one single thing, right? It's the sum of many parts that taken together allow employers to automate significant portions um, of their hiring. At the top, you have sourcing, employers reaching out to find applicants. Increasingly, this takes place on online platforms like LinkedIn, ZipRecruiter, Facebook, and others, which algorithmically rank and curate potential candidates. Next is screening. This is where employers consider information provided to them by applicants. That can include automated resume parsing, knockout questions, questions about schedule availability, and an ever-growing battery of assessment tests. Um, there's interviews, right? Um, everyone knows what an interview is, but technology can mediate this step, as Commissioner Sonderling mentioned, not only in producing transcripts of what people say, but evaluating um, visual features and video data or the way that audio is spoken. And I'll just mention briefly at the bottom here, there's selection, you know, there's how employers make an offer and then how they evaluate their employees once they're employed. Um, at each of these steps, there are a range of technologies that automate rejections and rank candidates, and too often to the disadvantage of protected groups, uh, including people with disabilities. At the top stage, these platforms do optimizations that all too often prioritize common applicants for this type of job, right? You, you seek to find a software uh, programmer on Facebook, you're disproportionate likely to get a man in his 30s in the California Bay Area. At the next stage, poorly designed resume screening models can learn that folks named Jared who played high school lacrosse are your most best candidates, right? Um, and then at the interviewing stage, I don't think I need to elaborate on why analyzing someone's appearance or manner of speaking opens the door to discrimination. That's the 40,000 foot view. And I wanna use just my last couple of minutes here to get even more practical and give you a taste of how large hourly employers are using hiring technologies today. Um, very quickly here, we did a research report where we submitted a lot of applications to large entry-level hourly employers. Our goal was just to see what assessments are we seeing in the hiring process. Um, just a couple of top-level conclusions. 
Virtually every employer uses what's called an applicant tracking system as the backbone of their hiring process. These are highly configurable. Employers can use them to deploy background checks, resume screening, candidate ranking models, and assessment tests. Um, it's like Lego blocks. It's mix and match. There's infinite possibilities. It's not that an ATS system is bad or good, but it's never been easier for employers to experiment with new hiring technologies and screening tools in their hiring process. Um, we're here talking today about AI, but I really want to hammer this point home. In the real world, what we see is a blend of cutting edge predictive technologies and hiring systems that are based on more traditional selection procedures. There's not a bright line between AI and personality tests, right? And all too often, personality tests and the data they yield feed in to other ranking algorithms and ways of hiring candidates. And so I want to kind of break down. Um, it's not just facial recognition or pen and paper. It's all kind of blending together. Handful of concerns for you based on this, this employer population. Background checks, which we all know can be illegitimate and discriminatory barriers to employment, are easier than ever for employers to adopt. Click of a mouse, automated, done. Your applicants are rated in part relying on background checks. Um, in every single application we submitted, we got little to no feedback in the application process. No sign that we may have, that our schedules were incompatible, that we may have quote unquote failed a personality test, any other kinds of basic, basic signal, almost nothing back. Uh, employers provided few upfront details about available accommodations for applicants with disabilities. And the personality tests we saw did not clearly measure essential functions for these jobs, such as checking somebody out at a grocery store. And we know these are likely to discriminate against different kinds of applicants. Rounding the corner, I just want to put a few of these questions in front of you, because I think it's really important to see what's out there today. From CVS. Do you work in an environment where there are high performance expectations or you are highly compensated for your work? From Home Depot, do you feel bothered about leaving litter in a dirty park or a clean one? And from Amazon, if I had to list everything I felt grateful for, it would be a very long list. And I just put these questions before you, right? I mean, I, I think it really kind of boggles my mind why a subsistence level, entry level, hourly job would require evaluation on these factors, much less have these factors go into an algorithmic automated system. In closing, I think that AI provides an opportunity for you as a regulator to revisit regulation and guidance on hiring selection procedures broadly. I would encourage you not to try to isolate and define AI and, and, and get into the guts <laughs> of how these algorithms work, but rather think broadly because all of these systems are connected. Um, Uniform guidelines are a decade old and showing their age. I know it's hard to rewrite those, but even some preliminary work and guidance could have a substantial impact. We know that background checks have long been a ubiquitous source of disparate impact. Same, um, I would say, for personality tests. Hiring technologies are a force multiplier. With a click of a button, tens of thousands of applicants are put through these hoops. And last of all, However possible, the cheat code to this, in my mind, to making progress is getting employers to focus on essential job functions wherever possible. You see this reflected in the ADA technical assistance manual, but if you can get employers focused on essential functions, what do we really need from our workers? Then I think a lot of the dangers and ambiguity of AI naturally fall away if you have to articulate those essential functions. So that's where I wanna leave it today. Thank you again uh, for inviting us to present. Uh, some email addresses up on the screen for the video if you want to reach out to the team at Eftern on these issues. And I look forward to hearing from my other panelists. Thank you very much, Mr. Rika. Excellent uh, presentation. I'm very grateful for your work. Uh, we'll hear now from Maria Town, President and CEO of the American Association of, Pers of People with Disabilities, AAPD, which is a national disability rights organization advocating for the rights of persons with disabilities, including equal uh, opportunity in the workplace. Thank you so much, Chair Burroughs. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Maria Town. I serve as the president and CEO of the American Association of People with Disabilities. My pronouns are she, her. And for a visual description, I'm a white woman with brown hair. I'm wearing bold lipstick. And in the spirit of Mardi Gras, I am wearing a multicolored outfit. 
Um, again, thank you to Chair Burroughs and Commissioner Sonderling for your interest in addressing disability bias in AI human resources tools and for your willingness to engage the disability community on this important issue. Thank you as well to the EEOC staff who have made today's dialogue possible. AI hiring and talent management tools have become ubiquitous in the world of work as you have just seen, from tools to start through thousands of applications for single positions, personality tests to determine a candidate's fit for a particular job, or tools that monitor and assess employee performance. Artificial intelligence-driven human resource decisions are present at every part of some workers' employment journeys. I wish I could say that people with disabilities have become as ubiquitous in the world of work as these AI tools, but we know that people with disabilities continue to experience significant disparities in the workplace, in the job market, and in employment overall. Um, not only is there a higher rate of unemployment, but the disability community has a much higher rate of complete disengagement from the workplace compared to our peers without disabilities. There is hope that some AI tools, which intentionally center accessible and inclusive design, will remove barriers to the job market and uh, further support the goals of disabled job seekers. Tools like Our Ability, designed by John Robinson, a disabled founder who helps lead AAPD's Start Access Initiative, uh, uses an automated AI chatbot to better connect job seekers with disabilities to jobs that match their skills, interests, and desires. Zamo AI is working to produce accessibility-friendly interfaces for various online job boards. This will enable people with disabilities to get job details from a job description <clears throat> that better align with their skills and experience given the requirements of the position and complete the application process more easily. While I'm hopeful about the further development of these tools and others like them, the limited information we already have about the impacts of AI hiring tools on disabled people makes me very concerned that these tools are already creating significant barriers to employment that will be incredibly difficult to fully mitigate. In our Centering Disability and Technology report, AAPD and the Center for Democracy and Technology note that current research has found that algorithmic-based online hiring assessments and other online AI recruiting tools perpetuate biases before a candidate can advance in the employment process. A new report found that a commonly used hiring assessment, um, quote, massively discriminates against many people with disabilities that significantly affect facial expression and voice. And I, I want to just name right now, you might be seeing me getting very nervous. I have cerebral palsy, a disability that often makes me um, spastic and uh, unable to control my own movement. It's likely that if I were subjected to one of these tests, it would deem me unqualified for any job and I would not advance in the process. Similarly, personality tests are deeply concerning to individuals who may be autistic, who have uh, those who have psychiatric disabilities uh, or others who are just not able to interact with the interface. Uh, despite their growing presence in the job market and, the, and in the workplace, there's very little awareness of these tools impacts on hiring decisions or promotion and retention decisions on the part of people with disabilities who may be directly impacted by them and even less awareness of what steps to pursue if an individual feels like they have been discriminated against due to algorithmic bias. There is concern in the disability community that technology in many cases has enabled the removal of direct accountability, putting distance between human decision makers and the outcomes of these hiring processes and other HR processes. It's for this reason that we encourage guidance to say that job seekers and others who um, <clears throat> whose outcome decisions will be directly impacted by AI be informed of these processes and provide active consent for the use of these tools. One of the potential steps that's frequently discussed to address the bias embedded in AI systems is to develop disability-focused audit tools. As a cross-disability organization, one of the most vital elements to AAPD's work is a recognition of the diversity within the disability community. Disability can include everything from cerebral palsy like I have 
to Crohn's disease, to deafness, to long COVID, as I know that the EEOC has recently addressed. The diversity in the disability community often means that our needs and the bias that we experience cannot be captured in discrete data sets upon which an audit framework would be built. Further, building a disability audit tool is likely to flag potential bias surrounding particular types of disability, but not all disability experiences, and could further <clears throat> exacerbate employment disparities that we see within the disability community itself. For example, um, uh, an audit that focuses on screen reader accessibility or the timing of a tool could address bias against blind and low vision individuals um, and individuals with who need a different kind of fine motor access, but still have significant bias against people with intellectual disabilities or psychiatric disabilities who experience the worst employment outcomes. Further, many people with disabilities experience multiple comorbidities. So while bias can be addressed for one of the disabilities a person experience, it may not be addressed for the others. And I question how an audit tool uh, could really address this very complex reality. Another tact that an, an employer might use is to offer accommodations to job seekers with disabilities. It's similar to the skepticism that we have around the impact of audits, the ability of providing accommodations and to opt out of AI hiring tools presents similar challenges. For example, requesting additional time to take a screening test might, may result in the development of, the, of a data point that an algorithm uses to deprioritize an applicant or could create a kind of disability disclosure that the potential employee is fear, fearful to make because of concerns around discrimination. As you all know, disability disclosure is a highly personal decision, often facilitated or founded by trust building between a potential employer and an applicant. How can a candidate build trust with an algorithm? Offering an interview instead of participating in an AI screening is similarly fraught because as you mentioned, Commissioner Sonderling, uh, the interview process is riddled with bias against people with disabilities. And in, so in closing, uh, I wanna join my colleagues in, in their recommendations for the EEOC and its pursuit of solutions to this issue. But in working to ensure that <clears throat> these newer, more novel and, and even tools of the future uh, helped to help to end bias against disabled people, we need continued investment in ensuring that the traditional, traditional hiring tools um, and mechanisms for finding, uh, applying, and ultimately advancing in a job um, are removed of bias themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Town. And now we'll hear, hear from Roland Bain. An attorney by training, Mr. Bain became a disability rights advocate after his family's personal experiences. Uh, and we'd love to hear from you now. Terrific. Thank you, Chair Burroughs, Commissioner Sonderling, and others. Um, my name is Roland Bain. My pronouns are he, him, and his. Uh, I am a white male, age 61. Uh, and notwithstanding Mardi Gras, uh, I am dressed somewhat uh, somberly in a brown cardigan. Uh, a blue shirt and I have glasses. Uh, I am delighted uh, to be here and so thankful that uh, the commission is taking up these issues. Uh, as Chair Burroughs mentioned, uh, my entry into uh, the disability rights field came uh, in uh, January of 2011. My son, Kyle, who was a junior at college at the time, uh, was uh, diagnosed with bipolar disorder uh, and while my initial attempts were to, uh, to find a cure for bipolar disorder, uh, my training as a lawyer uh, didn't stand me in good stead in, in that attempt. Uh, and so I looked other ways of, of potentially using uh, the skills that I'd been fortunate to, to, to learn. Um, and those came to fruition in, in um, about June of 2012. Uh, my son who had gone back to school was looking to get a part-time minimum wage job. Uh, he'd gone in, spoken with a hiring manager, hope spoken with the department head. They said, great, all you need to do is submit your resume through our online system, uh, and then we can go from there. Uh, he did that, uh, waited, uh, didn't hear anything back, uh, talked to his friend who was at uh, that employer, 
and uh, his friend asked, and they said, oh, he scored a red uh, on his uh, assessment, so we're not able to hire him. And that was my first indication of the use of personality assessments, what turned out to be finding a widespread use of personality assessments, uh, and the, the beginning of my belief that uh, in a number of different areas, uh, the assessment usage uh, potentially violated uh, the protections afforded individuals uh, under the ADA. Um, so that, uh, long story short, uh, we filed seven uh, charges with the EEOC. Uh, two were taken up for systemic investigation. Uh, we uh, went forward with negotiations with another couple of employers, uh, resulting in some changes that I can't tell you about. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, it was uh, an area uh, that we felt uh, passionate about. It was also an area that, uh, you know, we had the confluence, the, the nice good fortune of A, being told the reason why he had been rejected, being that he had failed this assessment, uh, and then B, uh, having resources that many uh, might not otherwise have in terms of not only my being a lawyer, but having an access to a wide variety of labor and employment lawyers throughout the country that I could bounce things off. Um, so uh, we, uh, we engaged in that. Uh, it, uh, it sort of enlivened our, our 20s when typically uh, the children are pulling apart further from the parents. Uh, this was one place where we brought closer uh, and it went well uh, until August of 2019 when unfortunately my son uh, Kyle took his life. Uh, and while I am uh, sad about that every day, I'm also grateful for the 29 years uh, that we had together and uh, grateful to continue the work that meant so much to him. So, and that brings us now to where we're at. Uh, and I'd just like to sort of follow on a couple of things that some of the commenters have said. Uh, I'm gonna first start out with something on my own, which is just because you can doesn't mean you should. And maybe that should be inscribed on a plaque and given to uh, all the employers, or at least all the providers of automated decision-making systems uh, that use AI. Uh, there are a lot of things that we see out there, and it looks like a, sort of a magpie-like effect of something shiny, something new. I'll grab that, and I'll put it in here, and I'll tell you how great that is without really any significant testing and validation associated with that. So just because you can doesn't mean you should. Uh, as to new legislation, sure, new legislation is always great. Um, so long as it's written the way that I would like it. Um, but I'm here to say that there is much that can be done uh, with the existing legal and regulatory framework and that justice can't wait for new or better legislation. So we're equipped, we're ready, we can go. Uh, and uh, what I'd like to do uh, now is uh, I'm gonna pop up a, 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 a slide that'll serve as the basis for sort of three areas of remarks that I'd like to go quickly through. And in my remarks, I'm gonna be focusing uh, more on the initial screening uh, decisions up to the hiring decision. So nothing prior to that, nothing beyond that. For example, not an employee who's a con you know, who already is an employee who's subject to some concerns. So let me get that one slide up and Let's go. Well, I, I thought I had this done, but anyway, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, terrific. Uh, and, and as you can see, what, I, what I'm gonna go is sort of three main topics. First is unsafe at any speed. Uh, and what's that that's designed to do is to sort of, for those of you who are old like me, uh, remind you of Ralph Nader and his efforts uh, in the early 60s with the Chevy Corvair. Uh, and what I'm saying to you in, in some instances, and perhaps many instances, the uh, AI-based automated decision-making systems are built from the ground up with components that illegally discriminate against applicants with disabilities. Uh, and there's nothing you can do to massage those, to revise them. You just got to blow them up uh, and start with something better, start with something new. Uh, second, high risk, low reward. Uh, these are, as uh, Chair Burroughs has mentioned, widely used uh, by most corporations, uh, large, small, medium size, uh, and they're used primarily in the context of reducing hiring costs, right? When you saw the rise of internet-based recruitment, you saw a lot more applicants for job positions that put companies in a difficult bind of, I, I can't scale up, I, I don't have the cost to scale up my hiring department 10x, 
Uh, so I've got to find some way of hopefully appropriately screening through those initial set to get me down to uh, a group that I can, uh, I can work with. Uh, but the high risk, low reward, a lot of people don't uh, think it through is that there are a couple of provisions uh, under the ADA uh, in which uh, you are not just liable to the person who has a disability, but you are liable to all job applicants. Uh, for example, uh, if this is an illegal pre-employment medical examination, every person who takes that assessment has a potential claim against the employer. And when we're talking about major employers who are screening 10 million people a year, we're talking about a potentially significant liability that I don't think uh, many employers are understanding uh, or aware of. Uh, so part of that may be just sort of an awareness building with employers uh, about uh, where they stand. And that sort of ties in with a third group, which is uh, what I term rampant compliant failures, compliance failures. In my conversations with employers, um, many major employers, uh, the general response to, has been to my questions asking about their validation and selection process is that they didn't do any. Uh, that basically they go in there uh, and they say, this is being used by 70 out of the Fortune 250. It's being used by our competitors. And it's sort of like, you know, nobody gets fired for buying IBM in the 80s. Uh, so everybody else is using this, I'll do it. Uh, a person who had then said, who had said to their executives, we now need to, if this is what you want, we need to validate it. They said, why would we spend any money validating that? Because you've just told us that it's being used by all these companies. So ergo, it must be okay. Uh, and I think that what you will see uh, as you look into it is that there is, uh, a, a, in a sense, a wholesale abdication of that responsibility. And they roll it over to the third party providers. And the third party providers are not gonna be the ones who raise their hands and say, yeah, my system has a problem, uh, but you should use it anyway, right? They're gonna tell you it's fine, it's being used, uh, and that's where we need to go. So we dump, jump in a little bit more at the sort of unsafe at any speed. Uh, what we're looking at, data mining, deep learning, uh, and other AI-based tools attempt to locate statistical relationships in massive data sets. Um, but more data doesn't mean more insight. And falsity grows exponentially the more data is collected. So it can allow someone to define statistically significant correlations, um, many of which may be spurious or deceptive. Uh, also, the training data for most algorithms fails to include data from individuals with disabilities. As Maria was indicating, we have very low participation rates by persons with disabilities in our employment workforce. Consequently, if I'm going to be looking to our existing workforce, disability, persons with disabilities are undercounted and underrepresented. And the result of if you have a person with disability, uh, they're sort of an outlier. They're treated as noise or disregarded. Uh, an AI used for hiring algorithms analyze, for example, <laughs> a person's facial expressions, their vocal intonation, their writing. Um, imagine if you're a person with a mental illness that results in flat affect. Given the algorithm's treatment of persons with disabilities as outliers, how does the algorithm measure your facial expression? Or imagine you're a person with a communications disorder like President Biden who study, uh, stutters. Given the algorithm's treatment of persons with disabilities as outliers, how does the algorithm measure your vocal intonation? I think AI and machine learning have propelled ableism into a new era, one in which machine learned models embed biases present in the human behavior used for model development. And whether intentional or not, uh, and I'm thinking it is not intentional, this laundering of human prejudice through computer algorithms can make those biases appear to be justified objectively. And while it may be innovative, uh, the world doesn't need more innovative ways to discriminate against persons with disabilities. Under the high risk, low reward, Title I of ADA, as we all know, is unique among civil rights laws because it strictly prohibits all pre-job offer medical examinations. And EEOC guidance lists seven factors to be considered when determining if something is a medical examination. According to EEOC guidance and judicial decisions, any one of the seven factors may be enough to support a finding that the activity is a medical examination. ADSs trigger many of the seven factors, including being designed to reveal an impairment of physical or mental health, being interpreted by healthcare professors, professionals, and measuring an employee's physiological responses instead of measuring their task performance. Uh, job applicants with communications orders, uh, as, as I mentioned before, 
persons with uh, on the autism spectrum, persons with traumatic brain injury and Parkinson's are treated differently by ADSs because their oral and written communications differ from those subjects used to create the training data. And in that context, those ADSs are measuring job applicants physiological responses and refueling an impairment of their physical or mental health. Finally, to the rampant compliance failures, there appears to be widespread failure, as I said, by employers to select and administer ADSs to ensure they accurately measure a job applicant's skill and aptitude rather than reflecting an impairment. In conversations, as I mentioned, with representative major employers, um, they've indicated that they failed to validate their selected ADSs, preferring instead to rely on the statements uh, by their ADS suppliers. In one instance or a couple of instances, I've had employers tell me it's not a problem because we have uh, indemnification from those third party providers that if there is a problem, they will indemnify us. However, the scale of the indemnification is so great that it may be beyond the ability of that third party to do that. In fact, Connexo, which is now part of IBM, when it was a, a publicly traded entity, one of its risk factors that it listed in its SEC documents was that it may not have sufficient funds to meet its indemnity obligations uh, under its EEOC compliance. So while a test vendor's documentation supporting the validity of a test may be helpful, the employer is still responsible for ensuring that the tests are valid. Uh, to avoid violating the provision, employers should and must demonstrate how notwithstanding ADS, uh, ADS's reflecting impairments, uh, their selection of a particular ADS was valid and appropriate, and their efforts to find an equally uh, alternative, effective alternative selection procedure was unavailing. Um, and I'll stop there because I'm sure I ran over my time. All right, I appreciate that. Um, thank you, Mr. Bame. And now we will hear from Matt Scherer. You've been waiting very patiently. Go ahead. Yes, thank you, Chair Burroughs. Uh, my name is Matt Scherer. I am Senior Policy Counsel for Workers' Rights and Technology Policy at the, senior, at the Center for Democracy and Technology, excuse me. Um, and I first want to echo the uh, comments that have been made by the prior panelists on AI and hiring and automated decision making more generally as it relates to disabled workers. Um, uh, Maria briefly mentioned the work that CDT has done with AAPD in this space. I'll briefly uh, mention that my colleagues, um, Riddy Shetty and Lydia XC Brown uh, and Michelle Richardson, um, uh, who has since departed CDT, but uh, she did wonderful work in this space while she was here. They wrote a report called um, Algorithm-Driven Hiring Tools, Innovative Recruitment or Expedited Disability Discrimination that I just wanted to draw attention to. I would actually like to spend my time uh, talking about a, a kind of separate set of issues, um, namely those associated with Bossware. Um, and uh, can everybody see my screen right now uh, where it says Bossware? All right. So... Bossware is a term of art that um, was coined actually by the folks at the Electronic Frontier Foundation that refers to two different, the, the, the con convergence of two different types of technologies. The first is electronic surveillance. And these new electronic surveillance systems can track workers' activities, physical movements, and pace of work continuously and in truly unprecedented detail. The second is algorithmic management. And with those, the employers can increasingly automate management tasks traditionally employed by human supervisors, including assessing workers' productivity and performance and making disciplinary decisions uh, automatically, often leaving workers with little discourse. Examples of kind of well-known bossware settings, uh, bossware systems in different work settings include uh, scanners and warehouses and logistics hubs, which can assign tasks, track workers' movements, and measure pace and downtime. And there have been many cases where employees have been fired, sometimes automatically and without human review, if they don't meet these algorithmically tracked standards. Call centers, uh, workers can track workers' length of calls they're tracked along with their downtime. And uh, algorithmic tools even purport to examine the tone and content of their conversation to assess their empathy. 
remote workers even today. Uh, webcams, screenshots, key loggers, and activity logs can continually monitor workers' activities and downtime, and workers can be automatically disciplined or have their pay docked if they are deemed to be off task. So how does this harm disabled workers? Well, first, by enforcing a faster work pace, which is the number one use case for these sorts of bossware systems. Um, Workers' productivity is increasingly being monitored continuously and measured continuously, rather than tracked by the hour or by the day. And this kind of continuous one-size-fits-all approach greatly disadvantages disabled workers, first by leaving little room for accommodation, it, that any sort of one-size-fits-all system that tries to assess all workers using the same rigid yardstick doesn't leave much room for the ADA's requirements in that regard. And the resulting repetitive strain from faster pace can exacerbate the conditions of many disabled workers. Relatedly, these technologies are used to discourage and penalize lawful health enhancing employee conduct, uh, most notably taking breaks to rest or use toilet facilities. Breaks in particular are necessary to manage many disabled workers' conditions in addition to being an accommodation, a common accommodation in itself. Lastly, the use of these tools can increase job strain which is the term that uh, occupational health community uses to describe when workers face high job demands but low job control. And decades of research shows that there are many negative mental and physical health consequences for these. Uh, it poses particular threat to workers with anxiety and depression uh, because it increases suicidal ideation is one of the research findings related to job strain. Now, all of these things, uh, it also actually increase the number of disabled workers that are in the workforce. The faster work pace increases the risk of new repetitive motion injuries, which leads to workers developing new disabilities. Same thing with the penalizing of lawful conduct, such as taking breaks. The lack of rest breaks leads to fatigue, which is a major risk factors for workplace accidents and injuries. And job strain, extensive research shows that job strain is a major risk factor for new diagnoses of depression, anxiety, ulcers, and even cardiovascular death. The irony is that due to the weak uh, OSHA standards, Occupational Safety and Health uh, Act standards, on each of these issues, you're not actually protected from these things that cause disability until you're actually disabled. Um, I realize, of course, that addressing that is a matter for Congress and OSHA to address, not the EEOC. But it's worth bearing in mind that as long as these practices remain widespread, we will continue to see newly disabled workers who need protection as a result of these practices. Um, fortunately, the ADA does provide strong protections for disabled workers, and by enforcing those protections, the EEOC can help protect all workers. Um, under the ADA, Reliance on Bossware systems, particularly the algorithmic management components, makes compliance requirements difficult. A primary use case, which is eliminating and identi identifying and eliminating breaks and other employee downtime, um, well, those are often necessary accommodations. So the use of technology that kind of makes those accommodations difficult or impossible is likely to discriminate against disabled workers. Altering productivity requirements, subjecting them to intrusive monitoring, will often tend to disadvantage and screen out disabled workers in violation of the ADA. And automated management, uh, not unlike uh, what Mr. Bame said during his presentation, it short circuits the interactive process. It makes it difficult to achieve. So the recommendations that I would uh, like the EEOC to consider in this space, issue guidance warning that employers must comply with the ADA when deploying Bossware systems, especially when it comes to ensuring that they are engaging in the interactive process and providing appropriate accommodations. And to work with OSHA to identify employers with high risk injury rates related to pace of work. Um, using the ADA's protections in these ways to push back against these practices will force employers to deploy these systems in a way that ensures the health and safety of disabled workers and of all other workers as well. And um, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. Um, your presentations have each been incredibly informative, and I know they will be absolutely invaluable to the Commission as we continue to examine these critically important issues. The protections of the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Rehabilitation Act have open doors of opportunity for persons with disabilities, and we cannot let those doors be shut, even inadvertently. 
by failing to focus on the potential challenges of AI in employment. And before we close today, I'd ask Commissioner Sonderling if you have any final words. Thank you, Chair Burroughs, and thank you to everybody uh, for your very thoughtful presentations. You know, from us, from our perspective as federal regulators, we need to hear from everyone in the regulated community who are dealing with on this on a daily basis. So we really appreciate your insight, your knowledge, and that's why I'm very excited about these listening sessions in general, where we could take a whole different topics of all the areas of law we enforce, of all of our statutes, and across uh, all technology, so we can help uh, everyone involved in this process have the tools they need to be able to use these in accordance with the law. So thank you very much for your time and your thoughtful presentations. Thank you, Commissioner Sonderling. And thanks again to each of the panelists who took time out of their busy schedules today to meet with us. As we continue our work under the uh, AI and Algorithmic Fairness Initiative, we will continue to hear from stakeholders about the variety of challenges that AI poses to ensuring equal employment opportunity. And we will take very much your recommendations to heart as we think about our next steps. So thanks again, and I wish you a wonderful afternoon.